All right, thanks for showing up, everyone. Uh, I'm Eugene, I'm a co-founder of Ellipsis Labs. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about our vision of how to build a DeFi ecosystem that is actually better than what exists in traditional finance. So at Ellipsis Labs, we're core contributors to Phoenix, which is a limit order book spot dex on Solana. So this is part of our UI here. This is uh, the live order book updating and the entire state is fully on chain. So the matching engine is on chain, the entire book is on chain, uh, all on the Solana blockchain. Like I said, Phoenix is fully on chain, it's order book decks. Uh, to date, we've done actually over $24 billion in cumulative spot volume. Uh, daily volume usually between three and $500 million. So that's in the top five of all spot dexes across all uh, blockchains. And the most important thing in my mind is the market makers themselves are profitable and there's no incentives to market makers. So we have a really credible story that the liquidity on Phoenix is sustainable. So now I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what the path looks like going forward. And before we get into that, we'll need to talk a little bit about the history of DeFi. So early DeFi was really enabled by the launch of Ethereum mainnet, which was the first generalized, uh, generalized decentralized compute environment. And it enabled early DeFi pioneers like Uniswap and Maker and Aave to deploy their protocols. And they had these properties like, because they were built on top of Ethereum mainnet, because the contracts themselves were immutable, uh, interacting with them did not require any trust in the system. Uh, all of the protocols themselves were auditable and censorship resistant, at least to the extent that the underlying layer one was. They also showed there's, there's some net new use cases. So Uniswap enabled liquidity for a new coin without a centralized exchange listing or without a uh, sophisticated market maker. And lending protocols like Aave and Compound showed that you could actually have these completely trustless lending protocols where you don't need to trust your counterparty. But all of these protocols are actually quite primitive. They uh, were designed to be safe, they were designed to be proofs of concept, and they were really constrained by the underlying infra of the Ethereum L1. Those guys all came out before the year 2017, it's been seven years since then. And the underlying blockchains have gotten a lot better, but the DeFi protocols themselves have not. We've seen a ton of marginal improvements. We've seen Uniswap go from V2 to V3. We've seen a lot of ways to rehypothecate risk, to uh, stack yield with more leverage. But the core protocols themselves, borrowing and trading, have not gotten much better. And even when we go look at these new blockchains that deliver much more performance, we still see these original DeFi protocols getting copy pasted, which doesn't really make sense because if you have a blockchain that is much more than Ethereum, it stands to reason that you should be able to build protocols themselves that are a lot more sophisticated, a lot more efficient. Today, in the market, we're seeing this new school of thought that I call shitcoin nihilism, which is this very pessimistic view for DeFi. It says that DeFi is never going to outperform TradFi. We shouldn't even aim for that. Uh, it's, it's too lofty of a goal. The only thing that's gonna come out of DeFi, or maybe the only thing that's gonna come out of crypto, is these, these shit coins that we've made, and the only value add for DeFi is this casino that's enabled by regulatory arbitrage. Which, yeah, for sure, is the, the main use case that we see today. And so we're at this crossroads for DeFi, where I think this pessimistic view, which I term DeFi dystopia, is it's clearly where a lot of the market is looking today, just optimizing the casino that we have. But I think the future is a lot brighter where there's a ton of potential to actually build a system that is better than what exists in traditional finance. There's a few key reasons why this ought to be possible rather than just this pie in the sky vision. And so that's what I'm gonna get into next. So first we're gonna take a look at some of the problems that exist in traditional finance and what the core advantages are for DeFi. So TradFi is this really big system, it's global in scale. Um, 
but it moves really slowly and the core reason for that is it's been around for so long so TradFi traditional finance is a system that has evolved iteratively over a hundred years starting from a point where like equity in a company is represented as slips of paper in someone's safety deposit box and from that point we've like upgraded it to where it is today and so it's this really big system it moves really slowly it has a lot of scar tissue uh, there if anyone wants to make any sort of changes, there's a ton of different entities with different interests that all have veto powers. And so this really slows the pace of innovation, where something as simple as implementing a new order type on the New York Stock Exchange is a type of process that actually takes five to 10 years. Whereas in DeFi, that's something, you know, a new engineer could implement in, in weeks and just put it out into production. And I think the most important piece here is there's no opportunity for new ideas. So we've been stuck with some similar architectures uh, for a very long time. There's actually no way to, there's not even like a sandbox for which we can try new things in traditional finance. So it's very easy to get stuck in these local optima. So when we talk about DeFi, most teams really like to emphasize permissionless access and auditability, trustless auditability and composition. And I think these properties are quite important but when it comes to competing with traditional finance, I think the most important piece is actually permissionless innovation. This is the thing that enables DeFi to iterate significantly faster than the traditional financial system. Again, using the example of a new order type, uh, that's the type of thing that will take five to 10 years on a centralized exchange, especially a regulated centralized exchange. Whereas uh, for something like, like Phoenix, we built the original prototype in six months, and then when we were ready, we just deployed it to production and it was in this environment where we could see we could see if it worked or not. There was, um, you know, an environment that had real assets on it, the Solana blockchain, and it's worked pretty well. And we can also uh, deploy new versions if we want to deploy new versions. We get really fast feedback from the market, and this is the type of thing that's just totally impossible in traditional finance. So when I talk about competition, there's two main dimensions I care about. And these are really microstructure things. Obviously, there's a ton of other pieces that go into having DeFi be competitive. But this is sort of like the backbone. These are the things that are required before we can even go out and like do the BD to bring on the real world assets. Uh, this comes first. So the first is efficiency. For a trading platform, this is usually going to refer to the quality of the liquidity. So how deep is the liquidity and how tight are the spreads. And then we also need to be able to compete on sustainability, where we have all these DeFi protocols today that sort of depend on this infinite spigot of incentives that is unsustainable. And when you take away the incentives, oftentimes the, the usage just completely dries up. And we need to look at these in a very sober way. I think there's a oftentimes this desire to have this rah 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 moment in crypto where we all pretend that we have product market fit when actually we have token market fit and we need to look at okay how do we actually build these better primitives and the first piece here is better infrastructure uh, on the application side like i said before phoenix is really just this proof of concept uh, there is no way that Phoenix in its current form is close to good enough to displacing traditional finance because we haven't innovated whatsoever on the liquidity primitive. So it's the same primitive that exists on Coinbase or the New York Stock Exchange, it's a vanilla limit order book. And it's on this infrastructure that's like 10,000 times less efficient. It does prove though that active liquidity can outperform passive liquidity. So I do view that as a step function improvement in so when we take a look at the, the infra, you know, Ethereum mainnet today does around 20 transactions per second. Solana mainnet does around, excuse me, Solana mainnet beta does around uh, 1,000 transactions per second. And then the cost to land a transaction is anywhere from a single cent, maybe a little bit under a single cent, up to dollars. And this is about 1,000 times worse than centralized infrastructure. When you think about the cost to place or cancel an order on a venue like Coinbase or Binance. And we just need like really big improvements here. I mean, I don't think we'll ever get down to 1x while maintaining the properties that we care about uh, on decentralized infrastructure, but we should be able to get it down to a factor of 10 to 100x where we can get 
blockchains that do tens of thousands of transactions per second, where the block space is so abundant that the cost per transaction is under a tenth of a cent. Latency is also extremely important. We haven't really talked about latency much today, but um, market makers getting pre-confirmations under 100 milliseconds, ideally under 10 milliseconds, that's super important. And we need to do all this while still maintaining this trustless auditability, still maintaining permissionless innovation. Obviously, if we don't care about those things, then AWS has already solved this problem for us. Luckily for us, there's a bunch of teams that are working on this infrastructure scaling problem. There's two main approaches today. The first is uh, to scale the layer one, and this is done by, uh, I, I guess the market leaders today are like Solana and Monad where under the proof of stake architecture, just really trying to squeeze as much performance out of that as possible uh, through hardware and software improvements. And then the other approach is to scale via layer twos, where we're gonna toss out uh, short-term censorship resistant and get a lot of performance on, um, uh, for that trade. And the path to scaling these is quite clear, where instead of using Ethereum DA, you can use uh, DA from Eigenlayer, or sorry, EigenDA or, or Celestia. And then with uh, centralized or rotating sequencers, you can really crank up the performance requirements there. And as the, the cost of ZK proving comes down, uh, we can see these pretty clear paths for both layer ones and layer twos to get to tens of thousands of TPS. And then the question is, can we get the cost down low enough such that it's actually uh, possible to provide active liquidity. And then supposing we get the infra there, and I, I expect us to in the next one to three years, let's say, then we really need to take advantage of the infrastructure. And this is what is really missing from the market today, where the core DeFi primitives need to get more efficiency from better infrastructure. So on the trading side, uh, I think like the limit order book, active liquidity, makes a ton of sense, but there's still gonna be room for things that we can put on chain that we couldn't put on an exchange like Coinbase, for example. Uh, programmable liquidity curves uh, make a lot of sense. Orders with side effects, uh, these things can only be done on a shared state machine. And so there's a, actually a compelling reason for why it only makes sense in DeFi. On the leverage side, frankly, all of the borrowing mechanisms we see in crypto today are pretty much copy-paste of the Aave model from 2016, 2017. But when the blockchain runs really fast, when the Oracle update is really cheap, when the Oracle comes really, really reliably, like every half a second, every one-tenth of a second, you can make a much more efficient leverage mechanism. Uh, you can even have active liquidity there where things look more like actively traded uh, bonds, fixed income products on an order book or on some other trading primitive. And then your liquidations can be a lot less aggressive, which is just a, a better end state for the user. So there's a lot of uh, room to experiment here. Um, and I think the most important thing is when we build these big blockchains, we can copy paste original protocols that exist on Ethereum, and then they'll be cheaper on the new infrastructure. But the real step function improvements come from building better protocols that are uniquely enabled by the new infra. In the same way that Uniswap was uniquely enabled by Ethereum actually going live and going to mainnet. So we're working on all of the above at Ellipsis Labs. Uh, we've been around for a year and a half. Um, and we are hiring across all job functions, all business functions in our New York City office. So if you're interested in building the future of finance, not just the future of DeFi, but we hope we can take a real whack at building a better global financial system, uh, feel free to hit me up. Thank you. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. A lot of actions for my small question. <laughs> thank you a lot. Uh, you mentioned an interesting uh, topic about protocols of DeFi. And we understand that right now there are a lot of DeFi solutions. And what about some 
common protocol about this because if we speak for example about cosmos and blockchain communication so there is only one protocol only one way and speaking about DeFi for ethereum for solana there are a lot of ways and what do you think about future will we have only one approach or only one protocol or still a lot of, the, of them yeah i think it's pretty difficult to predict uh i think in general in crypto today we overestimate sorry we underestimate the difficulty of this like cross-chain interoperability problem especially if we're not going to uh, trust somebody in the middle which in the current crypto world looks like a, basically like a centralized exchange um, on the protocol design side I think no matter what you're just gonna end up with a bunch of protocols and there's gonna be this long tail of protocols that has you know not very much usage and not very much TVL and I think that's totally fine that's sort of the what you expect to see in an environment with permissionless innovation, where you have like a hundred well-meaning teams try to build a, a good liquidity primitive, or a thousand well-meaning teams, and at the end of the day, only one or two of them is gonna work out, but it's gonna be not obvious a priori which are those. Um, so I think that's just uh, the nature of the hyper-capitalist on-chain environment. Thank you a lot. Does it mean that yes, just smaller amount? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. I expect there to be plenty of blockchains with not very much consolidation and plenty of protocols with not that much consolidation for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Lord. We have one more, please. Uh, thank you so much for the speech. It was super interesting to listen. Uh, a small question. Am I understanding correctly that active liquidity means active market making, uh, where orders are placed? Yes. So, uh, th if we move as an industry on like even DeFi to active market making, doesn't this remove, uh, in a sense, the decentralized nature of, for example, like pools on current MMs like Uniswap, where you put the money in the pool and unless it's fully drowned out, it exists there forever and people can do swaps like forever without any personal involvement of anybody? Yeah, so there's still uh, permissionless access to the liquidity. Anyone can, anyone can be a taker on a limit order book. And actually, anyone can be a maker as well, so anyone can place limit orders. But yeah, it's definitely true that the barrier to entry to being a competitive market maker is higher, which I view as a good thing, because I care about quality of liquidity. Uh, and yeah, I don't think uh, you know myself clicking one button, should I necessarily be competitive with jump trading? Like, probably not. You have all these high frequency trading firms that have spent tens of billions of dollars in R&D over the last you know, 20 years, 30 years, getting really good at this business of electronic market making, which is trying to provide better spreads, tighter spreads, more depth to win the retail flow. And that competition is really, really good for the end user. Whereas I would view the, you know, the X, Y equals K world almost as a communist world where you have no freedom to provide liquidity where you want to provide it. You're stuck to this curve and that leads to much less efficient liquidity. I think there's also other ways to enable um, uh, more retail participation. So one pretty clear retail facing product that one could build would be lending to market makers, where if uh, I'm Citadel and my hurdle rate on the capital is 50% and then my market making strategy on Phoenix only makes 20%, I'm not gonna do it with my own capital, but maybe I can borrow from retail at, at 15%. There, there, there should be a way to make that sort of trade happen. Just here the main question is that, I may be wrong here, please correct me, but in this case the market maker is uh, the point of censorship that can be used uh, if they actively have to do something and they can press the stop button to stop doing it. Uh, this is the point of failure. Uh, yeah, but there's multiple market makers. In the same way that on a centralized exchange there's many market makers and probably all of them face some amount of downtime, some of them go down for very long amounts of time. And the end user doesn't really notice it most of the time because there's plenty of market makers. And the reason the market makers exist is because the business of being a market maker is quite good. So there's incentives yeah, yeah. to make this the case. Yeah, of course, I'm not speaking about like efficiency. I'm speaking about um, uh, censorship in a sense. That like the problem of centralized exchanges is in essence that you have to convince somebody uh, in the sex to get you listed and then you have to like pay market makers and if the market makers go out of business then you have to find new ones and like it's a lot of points in which the system stops being uh, decentralized in a sense 
I mean, I think the core architecture, like the social layer here, does end up much more centralized, where you, realistically speaking, have like somewhere between four and ten dominant market makers who make money, and a bunch of others. Um, uh, and, and there is some reliance on these guys, but when they go away, they get replaced very quickly because there's so much business opportunity there. And uh, there are like a couple of big differences here with the centralized exchange, where it's probably a little tougher to provide liquidity on the decentralized exchange, but uh, you don't have to worry, or your risk profile looks very different. Where okay, the exchange can't you know run away with everybody's money, and um, you know that no other market maker has an advantage over you. So actually, in some sense, that's lowering the barrier to entry compared to a centralized exchange with all like you know the fee tiers and whatnot. Okay, so it's kind of in between, in a sense. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just to be clear, I don't disagree with the premise of your question. I think it's a very reasonable point of view. Yeah, but thank you so much, man. Uh, amazing uh, presentation. Cheers. That's great. Okay, thank you. A lot of questions for my small question. <laughs> thank you a lot. Uh, you mentioned an interesting uh, topic about protocols of DeFi, and we understand that right now there are a lot of DeFi solutions, and what about some common protocol about this because if we speak for example about cosmos and blockchain communication so there is only one protocol only one way and speaking about DeFi for ethereum for solana there are a lot of ways and what do you think about future will we have only one approach or only one protocol or still a lot of, the, of them yeah i think it's pretty difficult to predict uh i think in general, in crypto today, we overestimate, sorry, we underestimate the difficulty of this like cross-chain interoperability problem, especially if we're not going to uh, trust somebody in the middle, which in the current crypto world looks like a, basically like a centralized exchange. Um, on the protocol design side, I think no matter what, you're just gonna end up with a bunch of protocols and there's gonna be this long tail of protocols that has you know, not very much usage and not very much TVL. And I think that's totally fine. That's sort of the, what you, what you expect to see in an environment with permissionless innovation, where you have like a hundred well-meaning teams try to build a, a good liquidity primitive or a thousand well-meaning teams. And at the end of the day, only one or two of them is gonna work out, but it's gonna be not obvious a priori which are those. Um, so I think that's just uh, the nature of the hyper-capitalist on-chain environment. Thank you a lot. Does it mean that yes, just smaller amount? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I expect there to be plenty of blockchains with not very much consolidation and plenty of protocols with not that much consolidation for the foreseeable future. Thank you a lot. We have one more, please. Thank you so much for the speech. It was super interesting to listen. Uh, a small question. Am I understanding correctly that active liquidity means active market making, uh, where orders are placed? Yes. So uh, th if we move as an industry on like even DeFi to active market making, doesn't this remove, uh, in a sense, the decentralized nature of, for example, like pools on current MMs like Uniswap? where you put the money in the pool and unless it's fully drowned out, it exists there forever and people can do swaps like forever without any personal involvement of anybody. Yeah, so there's still uh, permissionless access to the liquidity. Anyone can, anyone can be a taker on a limit order book and actually anyone can be a maker as well. So anyone can place limit orders. But yeah, it's definitely true that the barrier to entry to being a competitive market maker is higher which I view as a good thing because I care about quality of liquidity. Uh, and yeah, I don't think, uh, you know, myself clicking one button, should I necessarily be competitive with jump trading? Like probably not. You have all these high frequency trading firms that have spent tens of billions of dollars in R&D over the last, you know, 20 years, 30 years, getting really good at this business of electronic market making, which is trying to provide better spreads, tighter spreads, more depth to win the retail flow. And that competition is really, really good for the end user. Whereas I would view the, you know, the XY equals K world almost as a communist world where you have no freedom to provide liquidity where you want to provide it. You're stuck to this curve. And that leads to much less efficient liquidity. I think there's also other ways to enable um, uh, more retail participation. 
So one pretty clear retail-facing product that one could build would be lending to market makers, where if uh, I'm Citadel and my hurdle rate on the capital is 50%, and then my market-making strategy on Phoenix only makes 20%, I'm not going to do it with my own capital. But maybe I can borrow from retail at, at 15%. And there, there, there should be a way to make that sort of trade happen. Just here the main question is that, I may be wrong here, please correct me, but in this case the market maker is uh, the point of censorship that can be used uh, if they actively have to do something and they can press a stop button to stop doing it. Uh, this is the point of failure. Uh, yeah, but there's multiple market makers. In the same way that on centralized exchange, there's many market makers and probably all of them face some amount of downtime. Some of them go down for very long amounts of time. And the end user doesn't really notice it most of the time because there's plenty of market makers. And the reason the market makers exist is because the business of being a market maker is quite good. So there's incentives yeah, yeah. to make this the case. Yeah, of course, I'm not speaking about like efficiency. I'm speaking about um, uh, censorship in a sense. That like the problem of centralized exchanges is in essence that you have to convince somebody uh, in the sex to get you listed, and then you have to like pay market makers and if the market makers go out of business then you have to find new ones and like it's a lot of points in which the system stops being uh, decentralized in a sense. I mean I think the core architecture like the social layer here does end up much more centralized where you realistically speaking have like somewhere between four and ten dominant market makers who make money and a bunch of others um, uh, and, and there is some reliance on these guys, but when they go away, they get replaced very quickly because there's so much business opportunity there. And uh, there are like a couple of big differences here with the centralized exchange where it's probably a little tougher to provide liquidity on the decentralized exchange, but uh, you don't have to worry, or your risk profile looks very different where, okay, the exchange can't you know, run away with everybody's money and um, you know that no other market maker has an advantage over you. So actually, in some sense, that's lowering the barrier to entry compared to a centralized exchange with all like you know the fee tiers and whatnot. OK, so it's kind of in between, in a sense. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just to be clear, I don't disagree with the premise of your question. I think it's a very reasonable point of view. Yeah, but thank you so much, man. Uh, amazing uh, presentation. Cheers. Guys, thank you so much. Uh, this is all. Thank you. Please round of applause.